a podcast by Vision Point Marketing. Hello, and welcome to today's installment of Rock and Roll, the enrollment marketing podcast created by Vision Point Marketing. I'm Dana Cruikshank, Vice President of Business Development and Senior Strategist here at Vision Point Marketing, and I'm joined today by our newest group account director, Aaron Ward. Uh, Aaron, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Dana. Happy to be here. Hey, I'm really glad you could join us. Um, we're going a little bit off the beaten path for us. Uh, we're going to be talking about some of the recent uh, changes and adjustments to uh, athletic conferences and and how that's going to impact non-athlete recruitment, athlete recruitment, and just enrollment marketing in general, uh, the role of athletics and so forth. Aaron, I am so excited you are joining us today. You are a former uh, D1 athlete. I know you played volleyball. Lest I say it, a star volleyball player at the University of Central Florida uh, in just outside of lovely Orlando, Florida. Uh, and I also know that you uh, are uh, that you moonlight as a sports announcer, which is just fascinating to me as well. And I got to ask, what is the difference? Like, I don't know. Are you the color commentary person? Are you the play-by-play person? What is the difference here exactly? So I'm a color analyst. So basically what that means is I add color, aka context to the play. So somebody next to me, um, think Joe Buck. Joe Buck's talking about who did what on the field at that particular moment, who touched the ball, um, Lamar Jackson to Mark Andrews, where you have Troy Aikman come in and say, hey, that throw was really great because of XYZ. I do that the that throw was really great because of X, Y, Z. So I add a lot of color and context for people, um, especially with the sport of volleyball that people think it's just keep the balloon off the floor, which it kind of is in theory, but it's very, very complicated. And there are so many things going on. I like to just really educate people that are watching and listening on the intricacies of the sport that I'm very passionate about. So I'm very, very lucky to be able to do that. That is so cool. uh, Just all the way around. I have to say too, it is, it is always a thrill when I'm, flipping through the channels and uh, going through ESPN plus, and I'll just score on a game. You're like, wow, that is Aaron. That is Aaron's voice. I have, I've heard Aaron in a meeting earlier today. And now I'm listening to her on ESPN calling a game. It's, it's pretty cool. I have to say. Yeah, it's a great opportunity. And it's a way that I can give back to the sport that gave me everything. So um, full disclosure, I received a full volleyball scholarship. So Um, it gave me everything. It moved me out of my hometown of Kansas City, Missouri, which I love and love to visit, but knew I needed a change. Moved me out of there, got to come to sunny Orlando, Florida for free education, stayed here, met my husband and the rest is history. So I'm forever grateful for the sport that what I say kind of gave me everything. So it's a, it's a good way to give back, um, especially because I don't have joints that work the same way as they used to. So I can't play or coach or um, anything like that. So it's a really cool way to be able to give back. Well, that's great. That's great. Well, well, speaking of giving back, um, I'm wondering if you can give us back some of your thoughts here on uh, just these conference realignments and what is that going to mean for uh, student recruitment? Now, I know, um, you know, obviously it, this has implications for recruiting football players and and maybe those folks who are involved with recruiting football players are on this, are listening to us now, but um, I think most of our audience is having to recruit athletes from non-revenue sports, for example. So talk to me about the impact of having your uh, university suddenly playing in a conference that's on the other side of the country if you're not, say, a football player. Yeah, I think it's going to be really challenging for those non-revenue sport athletes. Um, And I think the reason is because being an athlete in general is just extremely difficult, right? Not only are you balancing the pressures of athletic performance, you're also balancing the pressures of academic performance. Um, On top of all of that, you're managing your life is a logistical nightmare, right? You get in, you played a match in um, California, you land in Orlando at 10 p.m. at night, you have an eight o'clock Monday morning class. There's a lot of fatigue and a lot of other things that play into that. So you can see potentially some of the implications from an academic perspective of a student athlete having to deal with all of that. So what I think it's going to do specifically for athlete recruitment is um, more regional institutions are going to be larger players in that conversation. A, because students want their parents at games they want easy accessibility for their parents to attend multiple games throughout the season, right? But also because of program selection, right? What program do I wanna study at the next level? 
if I want to be a broadcaster, for instance, I have to be in labs. I have to be at other games. I have to be doing X, Y, Z in order to achieve my college credit. So by having less travel, which some of the smaller regional division one, division two institutions do, they you open up the door for more lab type programs that can be more attractive. Think like kinesiology or exercise science for student athletes. Those are programs they tend to go into. It opens the door for them to be able to actually attend those more so than they would like a general online course. So it's going to be interesting to see how athletes now really truly put academic preference over athletic preference in some of the cases that we see coming, coming through and some of the decisions that are made from these 18 year olds. That is, that is fascinating because if, if I understand correctly, and full disclosure, Aaron and I have traveled uh, many parts of this great country of ours, uh, visiting uh, institutions of all shapes and sizes. So I've, I've had some chance to talk. But as I recall, um, you actually were not able to study the major that you wanted to study in undergrad, right? Because you were a student athlete. How That's common is that? It's it's probably more common than you think when you think about programs that are really lab specific. I mean, very, very free infrequently do you see nursing programs being done. Actually, one of the teammates I played with, actually, she studied, she had a biology undergrad because she knew she was going to go to nursing school after her athletic um, her athletic career was over because you just can't, you don't have the time to go to labs, do clinicals, anything like that. So a lot of the time, whether even with some of these online programs, a lot of those online programs are more more focused on the grad level than the undergrad level. You still have to go to those chem labs. You still have to go to those biology labs. And because of the the changes in the conference alignment, most of the students now, if they want to study those things, will have to do that over the summer. And over the summer is kind of the time where a lot of student athletes reset, right? It's where we get our biggest break. We have optionally mandatory workouts. They're mandatory, but they're only three days a week, you know, stuff like that. So there's, there's more freedom with that. And then that's kind of where you get, you fight any kind of burnout that could happen throughout the season. So now adding a heavier course load through that summer period is a, is a decision that a student's going to have to face because of all of these changes to the conference alignment and managing the logistics. Keep in mind that some of those labs are only offered during certain terms. So they may not even be offered in the summer. So it's just, it's going to be, it's going to play a larger part in how student athletes make decisions for sure. So I'm, I'm imagining conversations between parents and students of, oh, this is, this is be a great school to play for, but this is not, we'll never see you play. You're going to spend your whole life in airports and so forth. Um, it's just fascinating to me because I, it feels like so much of this is being driven by football. Uh, and, you know, football is, I've talked to athletic directors. I'll tell you, it's relatively easy to schedule six home games or so. And a few away games are always on weekends, very discreet part, but it seems like it's those non-revenue sports that are really challenging. Uh, like I can't, I just can't imagine um, like track meets and those swim meets and those those events that can take place over multiple days and so forth, uh, tournaments, which are more common in areas, other sports. It just seems like that would take a toll eventually. We have seen in recent years a number of institutions, both private and public, saying that uh, part of their recruitment strategy is going to be to expand athletics so that, I mean, I, I we have visited institutions where a very large percentage of uh, students or student athletes, sometimes 30%, 40%. It's not unusual these days. Um, if I'm one of those smaller institutions that has made this commitment, what what is the smart play now with these conference realignments uh, when it comes to recruitment? Yeah, good question. I mean, obviously you always want to recruit the student athlete that fits into whatever system you believe in, right? At the end of the day, don't lose the essence of what makes a good program and a good team. You still want to recruit the right people for your program. But I think that there's an emphasis on more leaning more regionally, right? You want to recruit regionally. You want to pull those families in. You want to have that kind of buy-in from the region. Um, I also think that pushing those programs that they're going to not be able to do in other places will be important. Anything, like I said, anything that requires labs. Um, Broadcasting, which was the, the, program I was interested in, I couldn't do because I would, I was participating in a lot of the athletic programs that would be recorded or videotaped to be used as fodder for your development and your courses. So those things are going to be really important. Um, 
engineering. Hey, we have a great engineering program. You don't have to travel a ton. You can study more. Things that are going to require a large lift for those students, push those programs to those student athletes in your region that you know have interests. I think one of the things that I find extremely impressive about the generation today is that the majority of them already know what they want to do. There's no like, oh, I'm going to go to college and figure it out. They have a very, very, very clear understanding of who they want to be and what they want to do. So by offering those programs to those students that you know are are interested in that, that's going to set you apart from the competition when it comes to the recruiting recruiting cycle. And obviously, again, having the student athlete that buys into your system is, is extremely important. That makes good sense. I guess shifting gears a little bit, um, these athletic conferences, you know, they have brands of their own, right? We think of, obviously, the ultimate example is the Ivy League. And a lot of people don't realize the Ivy League is just a sports conference. Uh, yeah. Really, ultimately, all it is. Um, what do you think is going to happen to some of these institutions that are that are changing conferences and so forth? What are some of the what are some of the things they need to be looking out for uh, when it comes to their brand reputation as they make this jump to other conferences? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that I find really interesting is that some of these what I'm going to call perennial power institutions, power five institutions, already struggle with having buy in from their um, from their local communities, right? Keep in mind that av- the average grad lives within 330 miles of their um, of their institution. About 40% of them stay within 50 miles. So you're already struggling with getting people to buy into some of your athletic programs, okay? Then you layer in a lot of times that these institutions depend on rivalries. Think we're at, what I grew up with, KUMU, um, You also have like Texas, Oklahoma. That's a really big rivalry. They're going to be in the same conference now, which is great. They were the same in the Big 12. But also you have like USC, UCLA. And again, those those schools have had um, enough struggle that I've paid attention to it in getting people to their campuses for football games and some of that traditional kind of college feel. So then you take away the close proximity to your rival and or – any institution that would pull some of those away audiences, and you're going to see a significant drop in attendance. Attendance, selling tickets, also helps institutions promote and recruit. You don't want to recruit to come into a stadium and see 50 kids to recruit for football or any other sport, right? You want them to feel like they're part of something bigger. You want them to feel like they have there's this like weight and power of the institution behind them. So as we start to see these conference realignments, you're going to notice that there's going to be a significant drop in attendance as well, um, which impacts the books overall. So it's really interesting to see how how not just, you know, okay, it's just about football. It's not. It's about how all of these other things play together and how funding, scholarships, other things are funded by some of these athletic programs. You know, it's fascinating, too, because I do think there are a lot of potential students who are not athletes, but who want that, quote, uh, athletic school experience, right? That that big football uh, school experience, that big basketball school experience, big volleyball too. I know that's out there, uh, but the uh, uh, it's interesting because I hadn't thought about that. But yeah, it seems like if your arenas are less full, if your stadiums are less full, if there's less excitement, if your team is perennially in the basement of uh, of your conference, yeah, you're going to lose that energy uh, quite a bit. Yeah. And I think that, but then I also think that that opens the door for the small regionals. You know, I just being an alumni of UCF, I'm going to talk about them, but they started in the Sun Belt, went to Conference USA, American, and now in the Big 12 for a relatively young institution, just opened in the 60s. That's incredible. But you're going to see that path being followed by smaller regionals because they're going to be able to capitalize on what they have in their backyard because they're recruiting from people that are within a smaller region, because they're going to start to build some of that local excitement around them. Because again, if I'm in North Texas, which is right outside of Dallas, am I going to be super excited about going to an SMU game when I can go to an amazing institution down the road for my house that's going to have the same level of excitement for their programs? I'm probably going to elect to go to the local one. So I think there's going to start to be this energy, that kind of traditional undergrad energy at some of these smaller regional 
um, Division I institutions that I think are really going to see a significant impact. And I think that's actually going to trickle to Division II and Division Three institutions. When you look at like University of Tampa and Fair State and other schools like that, they're going to be able to build off of the momentum of being local and that's going to really help position them more competitively in the market when it comes to recruiting the non-athletic student and the more traditional undergrad student. You know, I want to talk for a second about Ferris State University because uh, full disclosure, they are uh, a client with us at Vision Point. We love working with them. Just outstanding public regional up there in Michigan. And uh, they are D2 in football. And I believe they've been champions a couple of couple of times in the past five years, which is Really, in fact, we had a D2 football uh, clash between two uh, two clients, Valdosta State and uh, Ferris State, which was which was fun to see. But talk to me about how they have been able to kind of harness that uh, f- that big football energy, if you will, um, in in some of their recruitment efforts. Yeah, it's amazing that um, what we're seeing happening now, keep in mind, Michigan and Michigan state are both very, very good football schools. So there could be a byproduct of that, but I think what fair state has done and they're in look, they're located in big rapids, Michigan. What they've done is they are, they are part of the community in a way that I don't think a lot of institutions embrace at the level that they do, but also they're using it as part of their marketing and excitement, right? They're, they're leveraging it. They're buying billboards when they're going to the um, volleyball NCAA division two championship, when they're back to back NCAA division two football championships, when they have one of the great, greatest stories in football history of a guy playing lacrosse at a different school, coming to their school, playing quarterback, then and getting drafted by the Atlanta Falcons like that story is so great and they've done an amazing job of kind of like building the excitement around those great stories so because of that people want to come to Ferris State because of what they've done they're you you go to that that you go to Big Rapids and it is a Ferris State community which I just absolutely love I had the pleasure of going up there last year and it's it's something to see it's kind of like you take the feel of like a K-State in Manhattan it's in kind of in quote unquote, the middle of the state, but like it's built this whole community around it that makes it like people know about K-State. When they go to Little Manhattan and they have that experience, they walk away with something unique. And I think that Ferris State has been able to do the same thing up in Big Rapids. It's interesting because we've seen this with other uh, non-football FBS schools. Um, I had the privilege to visit, uh, they're not a client of ours, but I had a privilege of visiting South Dakota State University in Brookings, uh, South Dakota, and uh, very similar to what you're describing up there. So it's interesting to see institutions that are able to really build that sense of community around athletics. Um, and I, I'll, I'm just really curious to see what what the coming uh, months are going to hold for a lot of these smaller institutions in some of these areas where these conference uh, realignments have taken place. Yeah, and I think what you're going to see, too, is that the the defining programs for some of these institutions may follow where the student athletes go. Right. So if there is a physics program that allows student athletes to go and it, there's excitement around those students being part of this major, that school is going to be able to adopt that identity of like, hey, we have this amazing physics program that you can come to. And that's going to recruit non, non-student non athlete students. Like there's there's a lot of runoff of some of that. Um, and it really helps the student get excited about some of the program, program offerings um, at these institutions. How, how will then that affect, let's say if UCLA has a great broadcasting program, how does that then affect their, their position in the market with that? You know, so there, there's going to be some good and bad and pros and cons um, to that realignment when it comes to the, the program selection for students. But yeah, it'll be really interesting to see how the whole conversation or how this this whole thing plays out. It's interesting. Yeah, I really hadn't thought about that interplay between specific programs and being able to recruit student athletes. Have so you may not be able to do this program at this institution, but you could here. Uh, and yeah. so I hadn't really thought about that. Also, a true kind of funny story, just show you, showing you the power of uh, showing you the power of statistics and so forth. So I live in Blacksburg, where Virginia Tech is located. And uh, there was a while about 10 years ago when their star quarterback uh, 
was a child uh, early childhood development major, which is not not a typical football player major, but uh, was interesting. Now, a lot of people who go into early childhood development are not making uh, you know the big bucks, and there was not a large uh, major uh, at Virginia Tech at the time. He gets drafted in the NFL uh, for, and I believe in the second or third round, very nice looking uh, contract. So when average salaries were reported by major, suddenly their early childhood development majors were earning an average salary of about $450,000 a year at graduation. And that number was accurate, which is kind of kind of fun. I don't know. I, I, I hope they didn't uh, recruit students off that number too much, but uh, still it's kind of, kind of a fun little way, uh, fun, fun thing you can do with stats there. So um, I'm, I'm really curious in all of this. I know we talk about uh, football is really driving a lot of this change and people vaguely say, this is about money. Is this about the NCAA? Like you, you are on the other side of it, right? Like you are on the sports broadcasting side and, and so forth. What is actually driving all this conference change? It's media. So I think as media continues to get more segmented, like I can't watch a UCF game unless I subscribe to Fox Sports One and all of these different channels are taking ownership of different conferences. And then all the streaming platforms, like not a lot of these are on cable. You have to subscribe. Or if you are on cable, you're probably not part of the younger generation. So basically what's happening is I think it's going to make it more segmented, right? So they're trying to drive, the networks are trying to drive sales and they see that sports do that. So in order in order for some of these networks to stay afloat or to continue to generate revenue, they have to find the niche in the market, which is one of these conferences. So they've done a good job of setting, of establishing that kind of culture around these football games. And I think it will just kind of continue to segment that more. Now, what that means from the NCAA, I think at some point they have to step in and and try to do something to manage some of this, because I think the student athlete experience is going to see a significantly negative impact overall for revenue and non-revenue generating athletics. Again, if there's nobody in the stadium or there's no excitement around the volleyball program, it's going to be hard to buy seats at, at, at football games. I mean, there's, there's this culture around sports and excitement. I think that it's, they all work together. You know, when UCF's doing well, people buy into men's soccer and they buy into women's volleyball and they buy into basketball, they buy into all these things. Um, and so if, if the football program takes a hit from recruiting or whatever the, the contract may be, I think you're going to see um, that go, then that impacts how the media then makes revenue off of it, right? Less, less um, interest means less eyeballs, less ad revenue. So there's going to be some, some side effects of it, but I think that the NCAA, NCAA would have to step in at some point point and say, all right, that's enough. Enough is enough. I kind of thought that maybe this would be <laughs> some say that enough is enough. But um, I think that there's going to be, I think in the next five years, we'll see some changes still to how this impacts overall athletics and how we, how we watch sports overall. So you work in sports broadcasting. Mm-hmm. Um, so even now, small uh, regional institutions, D2, even sometimes D3, are um, being streamed across the country on services like Hulu and, and so forth, ESPN Plus, you know, the list goes on and on. What do you think is something that institutions could do to make the most out of these uh, broadcasts that are happening now all around the country um, beyond just trying to, you know, buy ads during those broadcasts and so forth? It's a good question because they a lot of the streaming platforms don't have traditional commercials. So when we do... Um, when I do broadcasting for UCF, we have UCF focused commercials during those, those breaks. Um, So it's like getting to know you, it's getting to know the institution, it's campus tours, because a lot of times people, there's some really great campuses out there that people don't know exist because they've never seen how incredible they are. I'm thinking of like Clear University in Pennsylvania. It's an amazing campus. So getting campus tour, getting campus visibility out to these prospective students that are watching this, that already have a vested interest or parents that already have a vested interest, um, whether it's regional or their parents of the students that are playing is really helpful. People need to see what you have to offer. And then, you know, being intentional with your advertising. Yeah. That 
it, it's really important, right? Having a commercial that gets people, gives people the chills, ha- gets people excited about you, gets people excited about the program and the the energy around your institution is incredibly helpful because without that, they're never going to come see you. Yeah. And I, and I wonder too, like, are there opportunities out there? And I'm asking this question kind of rhetorically, are there, are there opportunities out there for activations around specific programs during a broadcast? I you would know, think so. Yeah. I mean, we always see the the ring advertising and, and so forth that it's happening, but there's a lot of content areas that are open there. There's a lot of creative things we could do, I think, um, in the stands and so forth to really promote individual programs. Um, I don't know. It's, a, it's an exciting time. All the way around. Yeah. And I think you, I mean, you said it, you know, somebody's excited, somebody's early childhood education, interview that person and let other people get a feel for what that program's like. You know, I think of Jennifer Heppert, who I played with at UCF. She was a biology major with the focus in research. Like, interview her. Oh, my gosh. Like, she was an academic All-American, completely brilliant, comes from a family of academics. Both of her parents were professors at KU. Like, that's the story. Let that story lead you because representation for future students is really important. Getting that, hey, I see myself in that person is incredibly important. And I don't think we do that. I I don't think we capitalize on that enough in those like kind of micro broadcasts, um, which I think we could do in a really unique way. So if I hear what you're saying, then the micro broadcasts, if you will, some of which you participate in as a, as a color announcer, color announcer, color commentator, color (laughs) color analyst. That was it. Okay. These uh, micro broadcasts that you participate in as a, as a color analyst, um, if I'm hearing you right, it, it sounds like there may be more opportunities for institutions to interplay with the broadcast team or, or be able to suggest content to the broadcast teams and so forth. Is that reasonably accurate? Or? 100%. 100%. Even hmm. from, from my perspective, I want those stories. Like, because I sometimes matches aren't that exciting, right? Sometimes you have a, a blowout, a three set match that's over really quickly. I want those stories because that's fodder for me, but also um, I think it's just an amazing way to position the institution. And again, a lot of the times I told my husband the other day, I was like, I've seen these three or four commercials over and over again, because that's what's been given to the producing team. Um, So if there are additional opportunities for some of that program promotion, self-promotion, it's a great opportunity to do that because a lot of times when you look at the division one institution specifically, the, Broadcast is done and managed in house. There's no Remy, right? We don't there. You don't hire an outside group to come in, record, and then it goes away. Maybe some of the smaller institutions, that's the case, but we do have control over the content that happens in those breaks. So giving the producer and other people more content to use, they're going to be happy because again, we see the same commercials over and over again. Hmm. That is fascinating. I, I think that's a whole opportunity people don't realize is even there. I mean, not that, you know, obviously higher ed marketers are, are plenty overworked already, but uh, but that seems like kind of a layup almost uh, to use a really, I, just, I wasn't even realized I was using a sports metaphor there, but I guess I did layup. But I mean, it seems like even other things, like you said, like during a game that's maybe a little slow, the match is a little slow and it's like, oh, there's there's Caitlin Higgins digging in there. What else would you expect from a petroleum engineer? Turns out there's petroleum engineering at at you know this institution and so forth. That I could see that happening. That's that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, and I'd love more of that. You know, um, as a broadcaster, you would love to, you would love the institution to provide that to you. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's I mean, I moonlight as this. Of course, this isn't like my my day job when I'm doing this, and so it's hard to find the time and hard to dig through those stories. Um, finding out, you know, UCF's the the largest and was rated best employer, but UF was actually rated the best bang for your buck institution in Florida. So like things like that, like I'm seeing that kind of, that kind of stuff happening, but I'm not seeing like the little stories, right? Make it personal, make it relatable, make it so that a parent that sees that is like, that's an inspiring story. I want to push for my kid to go there. Cause as we all know, parents are influencers, aunts and uncles are influencers, cousins are influencers. So giving them the right information and appealing to what they would be potentially interested in can help help them be um, persuasive with their prospective traditional undergrad student. Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned parents. Um, I'm curious. Um, 
just how how big a role are our parents playing in the college athlete uh, decision process, if you will? Well, I mean, it's it's really important, um, especially back in my day when like I, you know, YouTube and quick vid- video editing stuff, and I'm going to age myself here, wasn't as prevalent as it is now, right? So sending recruiting tapes to coaches was really complicated. So my mom took all of that on. I mean, she made video, my mom learned how to do VHS editing. I mean, it's like, it's nuts what she was able to do. Helped, she was kind of like my PR campaign, helped me get on this like um, one list of 100 rising sophomores and juniors and seniors. I was on that list three years in a row because of her campaigning for me, but that's different to, um, that's more on the athletic side. But I think one thing when it came to making the decision to go to a specific college, it was, she was my sounding board, right? Like, Hey, this is kind of what I'm thinking. What do you think? And we kind of made a pros cons list. She was, you know, the first time I was contacted by schools was I got a letter when I was 15. And this is the biggest decision a kid can make in their whole life, right? Not only leave the athletic part of out of it. This is the biggest decision a student would have to make for their entire future and what education and what degree they're going to go for. So having a parent be there to be the sounding board of like, Hey, I'm going to talk to you about my experience. And sometimes you know, first generation students don't have that sounding board of that experience, but they can still go to their parents and ask them the tough questions. Hey, if this were you, what would you do? Hey, I'm thinking about this. What do you think about this? And they just kind of give another voice of reason where I think a 15, 16, 17 year old kid could potentially just pick based on emotion, having kind of something, somebody that's more vested in the overall interest of you, I think it's really important to have that. And I think kids lean into that, even with the access to information that they have now, you know, they could probably call a student up and ask them what their experience is, but none of that's going to have the same weight as their parents giving them advice. All right. That is, I mean, that that's pretty logical, but like when you spe- spell it out that way, um, I think that's, I don't know, it's, it's really kind of elucidating there. Out of curiosity, that institution that sent you the brochure at 15, did they even make your top two, top three list or? Um, I, uh, some of them did. Yeah. Some of them were enticing enough for me to go, but then some of them, I think they were like, <laughs> no. no, it wasn't even that. I think that they were just out of my league. I, I knew, I knew the kind of athlete I was right. Like I, I was never going to be six foot four. I was never going to be um, the most technical coming out of high school. I was just a very, very good athlete. I could jump out of the gym. So I needed a little bit of refinement. Um, so like a school like UCLA, who I did receive a letter from, I wouldn't have been the right fit for their program. Oklahoma, same thing. UCF was just the one that perfectly aligned with what I was looking for. And they, they saw something in me, which I meant forever in debt to one to hit for, but yeah, it's, you're very aware of where you are kind of in the marching order of athletics. <laughs> that's interesting. Um, I'm thinking back that old adage too, like you can't coach height, right? Like that's yeah. just one of those things. Just one of those I never things. had it, unfortunately. <laughs> but I could jump really, really high. <laughs> that's got to count for something, I'm sure. So let's jump into facilities investments for a while because, um, you know, the news coming out of uh, higher ed this past week is that, uh, West Virginia University is making some pretty dramatic cuts. Um, and it turns out part of the reason they're having to make those cuts is because of facility investments in um, academic and athletic uh, buildings and so forth. So knowing what a big gamble that can be, what role do you think uh, those facility investments play in recruitment of student athletes and non-student athletes as well? Yeah, I think any student athlete wants to feel like they're part of the quote unquote, big time, right? So having updated and newer facilities that reflect that feeling like it's a big thing on campus is really important. I also think that it's important for non-traditional students to go into a building and think they feel safe, secure, have access to the information and all the stuff they need. Um, We're seeing kind of this transition to like smart buildings, which I think is really important because You want to create an environment where students can go and facilitate their own learning. I know that that sounds simple, but 
you also have to make adjustments to who the student is now versus who the student was when I went to school. You can't just have a brick and mortar building with a teacher at the front and maybe a projector or something else. Like there has to be some kind of um, involvement, collaboration, because that's what the student now wants, right? They, they're they used to that kind of feeling and they're used to the technology as it relates to their learning specifically out of COVID, but just because they're a younger generation of, of um, technological learners. So it really does have an impact on how you can recruit traditional and non-traditional students. But if you have a significant drop in athletics dollars, you have a significant drop in media dollars, where you get the money to then reinvest in those facilities for the quote unquote big time for any of those those buildings that may need some infrastructural changes or updates. You're not going to have the same level of funding because of that. And this is, again, this is if, you know, we think that the conference realignment has the kind of impact it would. Again, I think the NCAA is going to come in and, and make some changes. And I think they're going to have some control over this, hopefully within the next five years. But right now, people are projecting budgets based on some of the athletic money and donors and boosters that are coming in. What are we going to see then now as a byproduct of people being unhappy? Are they going to be getting the same kind of funding for infrastructural changes? Yeah, it's interesting you say that because an institution I won't name made a conference move a few years back. As a condition of that move, they would receive more television revenue, but needed to make some pretty substantial infrastructure commitments. And unfortunately, the money just hasn't averaged out. They've actually ended up kind of losing money on the deal. Uh, and that has an impact really throughout. I I, I do know as well of uh, some institutions that have tried to make that climb up into D1, make those huge investments, doesn't pan out. And now every single student is now paying an, an extra, say, $1,100 a year uh, to pay for some of those facilities. Um, you know, it definitely factors into the enrollment decision at a time when people are really questioning the value of higher education. So it does seem like such a tricky balance. I, I, these are just not easy decisions all the way around. Well, and I think brand, schools can do it because they've built a brand, right? There's There's but, some kind of momentum behind it, right? It's not just like, oh, we're going to invest in the facility and then hope it pays off. It's about investing in, sign of, in some kind of brand development that gets people excited, that builds momentum for the program that then leads to the building infrastructure changes. It's kind of the chicken before the egg, but I think you can't have, it's not an if you build it, they will come situation. That only happens in field of dreams in most cases in women's sports, as we've seen. But I think that it's, you, there is a delicate balance of that, but the brand of whatever you want your institution to be has to be established for people to buy in to then lead to those things. It's a domino effect of boosters buying in, alumni buying in, that kind of thing. So um, it feels a little bit odd that it could potentially be in reverse, but I think that it really, it really does set the foundation for everything you do, everything you do moving forward. You know, I, I wanted to pick up on something you said there about women's sports in particular. So Within athletic communities and within potential students, uh, potential student athletes and so forth, is there a, do some schools have a reputation as being better for women athletes, not great for women athletes? Is that is that a thing or, or is it more of a team by team, program by program uh, reputation? I think it's it could potentially be a team by team program by program, but then you look at like when Nebraska's done and they're just like leagues above everybody else. Like they're here, everybody else is kind of at the they're at the ten, everybody else is at the five. Um, so I think with the exception of them, I think there's there's programs that are more focused on it. And I think I think athletic directors who look at their athletic department as a department and not as a sport based revenue generation system those are the schools that have the most success. You know, I'll, I'll give as much credit to Danny White, who was the athletic director at UCF before um, Timo, Terry Mohajir. And, and they're both like this, where they just buy in. They have just bought in. Whatever you need, we're going to get you there. They're, and it's not just because we're a non- revenue generating sport. It's because where everybody goes, they go. You know, there was a quote I heard when I was at the NCAA leadership conference. And I think I've said this to you before, Dana, mm -hmm. where it's like the average of the five people you surround yourself with. Indeed. So if you want to be, you want to raise your average, you have to raise the average of the people that you surround yourself with. And that's true in everything we do, especially in athletics. It has to be 
where we go, we go, and not where they go, we go. It's there has to be this kind of true sense of of it's a program in a department, not just one specific sport. Yeah, that is that is fascinating. It, it completely makes sense what you're saying, but it's interesting when we see really all these decisions being made for the sake of football. Uh, yeah. You know, it seems like that's kind of breaking that that spirit. As we mentioned, the burden that that's going to place on non-revenue sport athletes. I mean, that's that, yeah. that's pretty significant. So be interesting to see. What's your prediction five years from now? What, what, what is happening? Uh, we've seen all this realignment, not just with with folks going to different conferences, but also the money model is changing. You had mentioned about streaming versus broadcast versus cable and so forth. And, and that's the money is really driving all of this. Um, you know, wh- five years from now, what's your prediction? Where are we going? I think it's all going to come back to center. Honestly, I think yeah. what's going to happen is either conferences again, go back to the region model because it makes the most sense. It's how you get the most eyeballs. It's how you get the most people excited. It's how you build rivalries, how you build revenue. I think there's going to be more of, I think we're going to go back to that a little bit. Um, I also think that there's going to be a consolidation of some of these, you know, it's probably going to be Disney and ESPN. That's going to probably lead the charge in that way, just because they have the infrastructure to accommodate it. But I think we're going to see let like, Immediately, we're going to see a lot more segmentation, but in the next five, six, seven, eight, nine years, you're going to see kind of everything come back. It's cyclical. So that I think that's the cycle that's going to come back. Coming back to more regional opportunities, more and so forth. Well, it's actually a pretty optimistic note to end this on. So I appreciate that very much. So again, uh, today's guest is Aaron Ward, Group Account Director here at Vision Point Marketing. And I am Dana Cruikshank, Vice President of Business Development and Senior Strategist here at Vision Point Marketing. Uh, if you have any questions or comments on, on this topic or anything related to enrollment marketing, uh, the best way to get a hold of us is info at visionpointmarketing.com. Again, info at visionpointmarketing.com. Aaron, wanted to say thank you so much for joining us. And uh, thanks to everybody who's listening as well. Well, I, I will uh, catch you on ESPN Plus before too long. Thanks, Dana.